Good morning. I'd like to warmly welcome everyone to our service this morning. This is a communion service, uh, so we, we welcome you. We'll begin with a few announcements. Um, our offertory plates are in the back of the sanctuary. We don't pass the plates here, so they'll remain there throughout the service. Committee three serves morning coffee in April. The Inter-Lutheran Seminary class on Revelation continues on Monday at 7 p.m. Um, that is actually winding down now, so we probably can stop announcing that soon. <laughs> uh, so we have another big announcement. Pastor Jesse is out of town until April 22nd. He's in Florida, so yeah, enjoy that. But, and I'll be, you know, if you need anything, just get a hold of me. My number is here in the bulletin. Uh, he's, he's preaching down there the next two Sundays. Today we actually have Mark Antiojo is going to preach for us. So we're going to, I'm going to sit back and enjoy someone else preaching. And we thank God for his willingness to, to serve us in that way. As far as our schedule goes, looking ahead, our board meeting coming up on April 23rd at 6.30, Spring Women's Retreat in Monaga, Minnesota. Uh, you can still sign up, I think, for, for a few more days anyway, but uh, the deadline is kind of coming up here on signing up, so please get signed up if you're planning on going. And then just make a note that we have some camps this summer. Uh, you want to take a look at your bulletins for those dates. If you need to, to make uh, plans for that, uh, you should be doing that. Uh, with that, oh, I, another announcement. Uh, next Sunday, we're going to do a family day here at the church. And the plan is we're going to fly some kites. Uh, so next Sunday afternoon, maybe at... Three o'clock, we'll do it. Um, I ordered 50 kites. They're blank kites, and they they have they come with markers. You can draw, you know, draw some whatever. Make your own kite, and we'll have some fun flying kites. So plan on that for next Sunday afternoon. Um, I don't think there's anything else. So with that, we begin this worship service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our scripture reading is from Isaiah 53. We read verses 1 through 7, reading in the name of our Lord. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. And as a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, 
And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Amen. Would you please rise for our opening hymn, Sweet Hour of Prayer. thing I forgot to say is uh, Mona Erickson's mother passed away so she's out west uh, with her family so we're going to pray for them uh, that the Lord would comfort them in their grief. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Dear gracious Father, Father we're thankful for all that you've done for us. We're thankful for your grace that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to this world to redeem us and to save us and to give us eternal life. Lord, we're thankful for all of the blessings you give us. We're thankful even for the blessings of the natural blessings that we enjoy in our lives. Uh, we have food and houses to live in, cars to drive, jobs, health, all the blessings you give us and that we rely on for our lives. Lord, we thank you for these gifts. Lord, we ask that you would be with us today as we're gathered around your word to hear what you have to say to us. Lord, we pray that you would speak to each one here, that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to receive your word. Lord, we pray that you would be with 
Mark as he, as he preaches to us. We pray that you would give him your Holy Spirit and that you would calm his, his thoughts and give him utterance so that he could speak your word. Lord, we pray for all those who are suffering. We pray for, for Mona's family. We pray that you would comfort them in the loss of, of their mother. We pray that you would comfort them and comfort us all with the knowledge of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That death is something Jesus Christ has overcome. Lord, we pray for all those who are suffering with diseases, cancer, or any other disease. We pray that you would be with them. We pray that you would be with their doctors and everyone who is involved with their care. Lord, we pray for all those who are hurting in any way. We pray for those who are suffering in relationships, um, marriages that are suffering, or families that have strained relationships. Lord, we ask that you would unite us all around the gospel, around the message of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. Lord, we, we pray for our country. We pray that you would be with us as a nation, and we pray that you would be with the federal, state, and local leaders of this country, that you would turn us to yourself, Lord. And Lord, as this is an election year, and as we hear so much about politics and about the things, all the issues of the day, Lord, we pray that each one of us would turn to you, that you would turn us to yourself in prayer, turn us to your word, uh, to search out what you have to say to us in your word as we cast our votes, and so that we could do so in consideration of your word and in prayer. Lord, we pray that you would be with all those who serve us in our military. We pray that you would keep them safe, that you would bring them back home safely to their families. We pray for those who serve us here locally, uh, in hospitals, in, on police departments, fire departments, uh, road departments, or any other vocation of service. Lord, we pray that you would give strength and encouragement for these individuals to carry out their vocation in honor of you and that you would continue to provide for us through them. Lord, we pray that you would be with your church. Wherever it is that your word is spoken today, we pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit that your word would go forth in truth and that hearts would receive your word Lord, now we ask that you would hear us as together in silence we offer up our own private prayers to you. We thank you for hearing all of our prayers. And Lord, we also offer our thanks for all the gifts you've given to us, and we ask you to bless our tithes and our offerings, that you would use them for your purposes, Lord. Now hear us, Lord, as together we pray the Lord's Prayer Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We'll continue with our praise song.
Let's to turn to the Lord in a moment of prayer. Lord, we ask a blessing this day on the giver of the message and the hearer of the message that your word would go out and that we all would live your word through the upcoming days and weeks and months and years of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to read from the Gospel of John, basically the story of Lazarus. Uh, normally we ask that you stand for that, but I'm going to read a good-sized portion of it, so I just ask that you stay seated. I also am going to read it through the King James Version, and the only reason for that is I love the King James Version, and all my Bible studies at home are in that uh, version. So be patient with me. It should show up as the King James as I requested that. Reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 14 through 46, in the name of our Lord. Then said Jesus unto them, basically his disciples, plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes, and I was not there. To the intent ye may believe, nevertheless let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany is nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha also, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had said this, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, that's Mary, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house, and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have ye laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus therefore again groaned in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. 
Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he has been in dead four days. Jesus said unto her, Saith, saith not I unto thee, that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldst see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave cloths, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto them, Loose him, and let him go. Then many of the Jews, which saw Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. But some of them went their way to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Amen. I think for any pastor, there's at least a month full of sermons out of this particular scripture. I'm going to try to highlight three things that I'd like you to walk away from today. A little bit about Martha and Mary about Jesus and his weeping, and about the statement that Jesus made to Martha and her response, those three areas. To understand this story completely, we have to understand that Jesus was a close, personal friend to Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. This story comes maybe a month and a half or less before Jesus' uh, arrest, crucifixion, and resurrection. It's very close. It is the last and greatest miracle, not the last miracle, but the greatest miracle that he performs prior to his crucifixion and to his own bodily resurrection. Martha and Mary were close friends. And we say, well, how can you judge from that? Martha and Mary are spoken of three times at least in Scripture, one of them being in the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus and his disciples are at Martha and Mary's home, and Martha is one of the busy people, maybe the older of the two sisters, doesn't say, but I'm just guessing, and she is in a state of excitement, overworked, getting everything prepared for the disciples and for Jesus. And she's bothered by the fact that her sister Mary is not helping her. That's in the Gospel of Luke. And so Martha, when she has a chance, complains to Jesus to do something, to get Mary to help her. And Jesus' response is a mild, mild rebuke, saying, Martha, you have many things to worry about. And in a sense, they're, they're proper. I think of the women that work in the kitchen every Sunday, especially if we have a meal. They have lots of things to get prepared. And some of those women, primarily, don't have a chance to come into the sermon to actually listen to the gospel being preached. They might hear it in a speaker, but they're getting ready. Martha is mad because Mary's not helping. And Jesus says, Martha, Mary is listening to what I'm saying. That is of greater value at this moment of time. It's not wrong for you to be busy. It's not wrong for you, but it's wrong for you to feel put out by Mary's reaction. Let her be. Bethany is close to Jerusalem, so you can understand that sometimes during the ministry, Jesus might have stopped at their home many times. Again, I will say, Martha and Mary will all speak of them together. 
We don't know anything about Lazarus except that he died. Lazarus doesn't say anything. We don't know whether Lazarus is the older of the, uh, the three, the middle-born, or the youngest. Again, I tend to think of him as being the youngest because they are very, very saddened by his death. We meet Martha and Mary one other time. In the next chapter over from the John chapter that I just read. And this happens the week before, actually days before Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem, which we call Palm Sunday. And if you remember, Martha and Mary, again, are feeding Jesus and his disciples. They're celebrating the fact that Lazarus is back alive again. And in a moment of, what would you say, uh, a moment of pure understanding and yet not understanding, Mary gets up and takes an expensive uh, herb or spice called spikenard. And it's been said that it can cost upwards of a year's worth of wages. And she takes this whole bottle and pours it over Jesus and wipes his feet with her long hair. So Mary had an understanding of what Jesus was going to be facing. Not totally understanding, but feeling that something was going to be happening in the upcoming weeks, and obviously it did happen. So in the Gospels, we see Martha and Mary and Lazarus three different times. It's important to understand that Jesus was close, not just to his disciples, but to other people. And Martha and Mary and Lazarus were three people that he was close to as friends. It's also understanding to say that Jesus actually held off coming when he could have come earlier. You see, Jesus did raise people from the dead. I think Jairus' daughter is one of them that he did. But it came so suddenly that he was there moments after everybody thought she had passed away. So the argument could be made that she just fell asleep for a period of time. But you don't hide the fact that a body's been laying in the grave for four days, as the scripture says, and smells. This is the first raising from the dead that Jesus did that everybody absolutely knew that Lazarus had died. And they knew that Jesus had done miracles because Martha, when Jesus finally gets close to Bethany, Martha goes out to meet him, does she not? And says, Lord, if you had come earlier, he may not have died. And some of the people that were following said, this man that had given back sight to the blind and back to the use of uh, their legs to the crippled, why couldn't he have come earlier to do the same thing for Lazarus? And Jesus said something very profound. He said, I am the resurrection and the life he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And then he asks Martha, do you believe this? Do you believe this? And Martha makes a statement of faith that's equal, in my opinion, to the statement of faith that Simon Peter earlier on said, when Jesus said, who do people say that I am? And a lot of people come up and a lot of disciples say this and that, you're this and that, you're Moses reincarnated or whatever. And Jesus turns to, to Simon Peter and says, well, who do you say that I am? And Simon makes that statement, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Martha makes a similar statement, just as profound. She says, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. 
She believes it to the point of being able to make that statement, but yet even further on in this actual chapter, not quite understanding that Jesus himself is going to have to go to the cross and suffer the crucifixion and rise again from the dead himself. And we say, how can that be? Well, take a look at the disciples. The disciples, until Jesus shown up in the room where they were on Easter Sunday, didn't quite believe. They believed, they stated, but not quite there. And in one sense, Martha is no different, but she made that statement. You are the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And I want to say something about what Jesus said. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. And I had to look up about the I am, because I, when I ever hear the Jesus claiming to be I am something, do you know that it goes all the way back to the Old Testament? Do you remember when Moses was on the mountain with the burning bush when he came to speak with God himself in the burning bush? He couldn't look on God directly. So God had a burning bush. And they had a conversation. You're going to have to go back to Israel or back to Egypt to flee, to free my people. And at the end of that conversation, Moses asked God, what do I call you? And do you remember what God's response was to Moses? I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. The Old Testament has many instances of God proclaiming the I am. And in the New Testament, especially in the book of John, in the Gospel of John, I am exists seven times. And let me speak them to you. In John chapter 6, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. In John chapter 8, I am the light of the world. In chapter 10, I am the door of the sheep. John chapter 10 later on, I am the good shepherd. And then John chapter 11, which you just read, I am the resurrection and the life. John chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And John chapter 15, I am the true vine. There are so many times in, in Jesus' ministry, he made the claim. He made the claim in many different ways. Remember when he made the claim that he was the fulfillment of the, of the prophecies made about him when he was talking to his own people in Nazareth? And he said, I am the fulfillment of that prophecy? They threw him out and were going to stone him, but he was able to walk away. His claim to be the I am is a claim that goes all the way back to the Old Testament time, especially to God speaking with Moses. It was his, one of his ways of proclaiming his divinity. His idea, his fact that he is God. He is the son of God. He is claiming to be equal to God. And it just re it reaffirms that with, again, I'm going to read it again to you. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. We go further on. When Mary comes, Mary who sat at the feet of Jesus took that time. And she basically says the same thing. He saw her weeping. 
And he basically groaned in his spirit and he wept. People make a big deal out of saying, and I'll say it myself, the shortest verse in the whole Bible is that verse, Jesus wept. And I had to think myself, why? What was he weeping about? When you look at some commentaries, some theologians take the opinion that Jesus wept because he was frustrated by the unbelief of the people around him. Even his disciples. He would get a little exasperated at his disciples for not completely understanding what he was saying as clearly as he could make it to them. They would not believe. They would not understand completely. And they did not understand completely until his resurrection. But I think, even more so, that Jesus wept because at the same time he was fully God, the Christ, the Son of the living God, <clears throat> he was also fully human. He wept because he saw how Martha and Mary were totally saddened by the fact that their brother, Lazarus, died. He saw the human condition from the perspective not only of being God, but the perspective of being fully human. He was going to go through the cross, the suffering that he was going to go through, fully human. When they beat his back and put the crown of thorns on his head, he was fully human. He felt that physical pain. And at this time, with Lazarus being in the grave for four days, he felt the pain of the loss that he was suffering as a human. And then he could see the suffering in the two sisters that mourned his loss. I think it was both. But I think even more it was that he was, the human part of him was saying, this is where we are as human beings. And we all know that every one of us here are going to die someday. We all know that heaven bless that we live long enough to see that our parents die, that we're still living. We also know that people within our families die before their time. And it's not an easy thing to go through. There is loss. There is pain. There's uncertainty in living. We all go through those type of trials and tribulations every time. But we also know that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. We also know that there is something more to the pain and suffering of being a human being. We also know that there can be joy, it can be peace, there can be forgiveness, there can be reconciliation, there can be friendship. Everything that Jesus taught can still be ours as Christians. There can be happiness, but we're all still going to die. And is that a bad thing when what we are being offered is a life eternal with him? Jesus wept for both those reasons, for our unbelief, for our tendency to look at our own problems and say, it can't get worse than this. And also for knowing the pain and suffering that his friends are going through. When we are believers in Christ, we are more than just friends. We are brothers and sisters of Christ. And it makes sense that Jesus, as a human being at that time, would feel that pain and suffering with us. Finally, when he raised Lazarus from the dead and he came out, what were the two reactions of people? The last two verses of my reading 
Many of the Jews which came to Mary had seen the things which Jesus did and believed on him. But some of them went their way to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. When Jesus comes again on his second coming, he's going to come in all glory and no one will be able to mistake who Jesus the Christ is at that time. But when he was amongst human beings back 2,000 years ago, performing miracles and doing this one miracle, this one most important miracle right before Holy Week, so to speak, Many believed, and many did not. It's no different today. If he were to come, not as a second coming, but if he were to come amongst us right now and perform miracles, there would be a lot that would believe, and there would be a lot that would still walk out, and just not. And you also have to remember that those that went to the Pharisees to explain what they saw and what Jesus had done made the Pharisees to decide that they had to put Jesus to death. If there was one nail in that coffin of their plan that was the final nail to make them go to that point, it was this, raising Lazarus from the dead. That's what finally did it. We can't believe that as followers of Christ. We cannot understand that. But I ask you to think about it. We are human beings. And we are so fallible that if we actually put ourselves into that position, there might be one or two of us that would walk away and simply just decide not to believe. So when you walk out of these doors, the biggest question that you can ask yourself daily is what Jesus asked Martha and what Martha responded. Do you believe? And will your response be what Martha responded? I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. Every day when you wake up in the morning, do you believe whatever comes at the end of the night, whatever has transpired through the day, however good or however bad it is, however mundane it might be, however normal, however terrible, do you believe? Because ultimately, ultimately, Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And he promises the same thing to us if we believe. I think that somebody else could preach more on these things, but those are the things I wanted to highlight. And from that aspect, I'm just going to leave it there. So let's close in a short prayer before we start our communion service. Lord, we just thank you again for the word that you've given us. You are the resurrection and the life. You are the way, the truth, and the life. You are the good shepherd. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And we thank you for that every day of our life that you give us to live. And in his name we pray. Amen. This is a communion service. For those of you who are not here uh, often, it is an open communion. If you feel led to receive communion with us, you are welcome to the communion table. I think we also have uh, uh, the uh, worship team is going to sing their uh, song, and then we'll go into the service from there.
You've often seen me help with uh, communion, but seldom have I ever been the one to pronounce the, uh, the communion words beforehand, so be patient with me that I would go through it properly. Let us pray with and for them who now will partake of the Lord's Holy Supper. Lord Jesus Christ, thou bread of life, grant that thy communion may be a blessing to all those who today shall partake of it, that through the power of thy body and blood they may receive peace and comfort to their souls and be strengthened in the faith, love, and a lively, living hope of eternal life. Amen. Truly it is meet, right, and blessed that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. This cup is the New Testament of my blood, which is shed for you and for many, for the remission of sins. This do as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And then let us now express our faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father from went Almighty. From thence you shall come, the judge, the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All are welcome to come forward.
Brothers and sisters, may this, the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve your bodies and souls to eternal life. Amen. Praise the Lord for this gracious gift that you've partaken of. Go forth and proclaim his death and glorious resurrection until he comes again. Arise and depart in the peace of the Lord. May this, the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve your bodies and souls to eternal life. Amen. Praise the Lord for this gracious gift that you've partaken of. Go forth and proclaim his death and glorious resurrection until he comes again. Arise and depart in the peace of the Lord.
May this, the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve your bodies and souls to eternal life. Amen. Praise the Lord for this gracious gift that you've partaken of. Go forth and proclaim his death and glorious resurrection until he comes again. Arise and depart in the peace of the Lord. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for a risen Lord and Savior. We thank you for the communion that we can take in remembrance of his suffering and death, but also his resurrection. We thank you for the opportunity to be here to listen to your word, and we ask that you would bless us as we go forward for the rest of this week until we come again. And now may you receive the benediction, this from Hebrews. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, who has, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you in which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be all glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you all.